Well, good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our Pathways to Careers in NASA Science event tonight. I definitely want to take a moment to not only welcome all of you, but to welcome our scientists, S.J. Ralston, Joanna Clark, and Jordan Marie Dudley. But also, I really want to acknowledge Margaret Baggio and Selena Miller from the Texas Space Grant and SEAS program for hosting this event. We are so very grateful for them to host this event because our team, and we're from the NASA Johnson Space Center and the Astro Materials Research and Exploration Science Division, we wouldn't be able to host this and connect with all of you without the support from Margaret and Selena. So a special thanks to both of them and the SEAS program. Also, I just wanna mention that we do have, and we will have a live Q and A at the end of the session. And there'll be periodic polls that'll, that'll open up uh, that are optional for you to participate in um, and there for us to get a little bit of feedback from you. What are we looking for feedback on? Well, tonight's event. So as we officially get started, um, there's a few things that we wanna be able to cover with you. One is a welcome and acknowledgement. And again, we are so thankful for all of you all of you come from about 32 different states and a number of different countries around the world and, and also Puerto Rico. We are so glad to have all of you with us today. We're also really happy to have with us our three scientists um, who are gonna share their pathway to their career in NASA science. As we go through this, each of our presenters will share their story and while they do so, we want to ask you to think about three to five impactful words or thoughts from each of the presenters. And we might actually have you do a, a bit of a word cloud in a poll that will come up in the slido.com. So this is a little bit new to us. It's a little bit of an experiment, but we thought we'd sort of get some of your thoughts while we're going through the presentations today. My name is Paige Graff. I'll be facilitating and leading the moderation of today's event, but I couldn't again do this without some other folks like Suzanne Foxworth, who's also on the line, Selena Miller and Margaret Baggio from the Texas Space Grant and Seas Program, and of course, our three scientists. So without further ado, um, our stars of the show are our three scientists. So I'm gonna stop sharing I'm going to turn things over to SJ so that SJ can start us off with the career pathway to NASA science that SJ has taken. So SJ, over to you. Excellent. Okay, so as Paige mentioned, uh, my name is SJ Ralston. Uh, my pronouns are he and they. I'm a Mars research scientist with Jacobs at NASA Johnson Space Center. And I've been doing that for uh, coming up on four years now. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how I got from where I started to where I am. So I grew up in a medium-sized town called Athens, Georgia. Uh, it's about 90 minutes outside of Atlanta. If you're uh, into REM or the B-52s, uh, those two bands are from Athens. Uh, that and the University of Georgia is pretty much what we're known for. Uh, but it's about 90 minutes outside of Atlanta. And I grew up there with my mom, my dad, and my two older sisters. Uh, one of whom is uh, pictured on the left there at the bottom. Uh, and I also had an uncle who was a marine biologist. He was uh, dean of the College of Sciences at Utah State University for a few years. Um, and uh, when I was very little, I was super into space and volcanoes both. And my uncle said, hey, you know, there's volcanoes on Mars. In fact, the largest volcano in the solar system is on Mars. And I was absolutely sold uh, there was no going back. That was what I was going to do with the rest of my life. Um, I was seven years old. Um, so of course I knew that. But with that in mind, I read and watched and listened to as much about Mars and volcanoes and outer space as I possibly could. I wanted to know everything. And that carried me pretty far uh, up until about high school, where I was finally able to start choosing my own classes. Uh, I started taking all of the advanced science classes and advanced math classes that I could get my hands on. Um, the science classes were a little easier. I had a learning disability called dyscalculia. 
Um, you may have heard of dyslexia, which is where you have trouble with words and letters don't quite stay put when you look at them. Uh, dyscalculia is similar, but for numbers. Um, so weirdly, I did better in calculus than I did in things like trigonometry or algebra because calculus includes very few actual numbers. Um, so that was fun. Uh, and when I was in about my junior year of high school, I started looking at four-year Bachelor of Science programs that would allow me to continue on a career path towards Mars. I had, my dreams had survived middle school and high school, and I was now looking to actually pursue them as a career. So I looked at a whole bunch of different schools, uh, mostly really good schools like MIT, but I also looked at things uh, closer to home like Georgia Tech, uh, which is in Atlanta, it was pretty close by. And eventually I went with Georgia Tech out of the schools that I was accepted to, uh, partially because I could get in-state tuition, uh, which is generally much cheaper than going to a school outside the one that you have residence in, uh, and also a, a specific in-state scholarship uh, that only applied if I went to a school in Georgia. I was also super into theater, which is why I'm dressed like a pirate in that picture. But at Georgia Tech, uh, I did my four years. I got a Bachelor of Science degree in Earth and Atmospheric Sciences uh, in 2014, which doesn't feel like that long ago, but apparently it was. And I also got the opportunity to work on an undergraduate research project uh, with one of the professors there, where I looked at pictures of the Martian surface uh, and tried to match the texture of the surface with what minerals were present to see if the minerals had any kind of effect on uh, the texture of the surface. And that never really went anywhere. It never got published or anything, but it did teach me how research worked uh, and gave me some valuable connections, uh, specifically with my, my professor. Uh, we'll get back to that later. From there, I wanted to go straight to grad school to get a doctorate. Um, at that point, I was still convinced I wanted to be an astronaut. Uh, but I only applied to two graduate schools, the two big graduate schools for astronauts, uh, University of Arizona and Arizona State University. And I didn't get into either one, um, which was kind of a, a big disappointment uh, and also a huge change of plans. So while I waited for the next application cycle, I moved back in with my parents. I got a job washing dishes in the back of a restaurant. Uh, and then when the next round of applications rolled around, I still didn't get into grad school. Um, and at that point, uh, I, I had no social circle. Um, I had really nothing to do. Uh, and, and my mental health took a pretty serious hit. In fact, I don't remember most of 2015. Um, that's kind of how bad it got. I, I know that all these things happened. I couldn't tell you what order most of it happened in. And eventually I, I had to be hospitalized to get really serious help with that. But by late 2015, uh, I was well enough to get back to grad school search. Um, I went and talked to the professor I had done research with at Georgia Tech, and he was able to recommend some more grad schools that I could apply to. And I did get into one of those, uh, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where I went uh, and I started on a PhD track uh, in 2016. And for this, I was very fortunate to be able to get a graduate assistantship, which is basically I helped my advisor with the research that she was doing. I did some experiments in the lab and uh, wrote up some results. And I was essentially paid to go to school. So I didn't have to pay tuition. Uh, and I also got a small stipend to pay rent and buy groceries and things like that. It was also during this time that I figured out that I was trans. Um, and this sort of shed some light on some of my earlier mental health issues. Uh, and as I started transitioning, my life got a lot less miserable, um, but a lot more complicated. There was a lot of stuff that I had to do. Um, so I was not actually able to complete the PhD track. I, I dropped back to a master's degree instead, which is a two-year degree. Uh, but I did complete that degree and I did graduate. Uh, in 2018 with a focus on geochemistry. And from there, uh, my advisor at UNLV uh, had worked with some people at JSC and uh, also the school UNLV had uh, uh, an agreement with uh, Jacobs where there's sort of an intern exchange that goes on. 
And I was, long story short, offered an internship at JSC to help one of the scientists there with her project. Um, and I think I must have done a pretty good job because uh, when my internship was over, I was offered a full-time position, um, which I accepted because I was very happy to have the opportunity to work for NASA. And uh, I continued my intern projects and also took on management of the soil chemistry and mineralogy lab um, and have kind of been doing that ever since. So a short overview of the work that I do, uh, it kind of breaks down into two buckets. There's analog work and there's simulant work. And those may kind of seem like the same thing, but I promise they're different. For analog work, we find rocks on Earth that are like rocks on Mars. Those are the analogs. And then we expose them to conditions that we think existed on early Mars. Uh, and if the rocks change in such a way that they end up looking like the altered rocks on Mars that we see with the Curiosity and Perseverance rovers, that tells us something about what the conditions on early Mars could have been like. We're kind of narrowing down the possibilities of what early Mars could have been like. The simulant work uh, is mostly for moon stuff at the moment. Uh, we pick up sand and gravel from Earth. It doesn't necessarily have to be super moon-like, uh, but we simulate the surface of the moon uh, at the moment so that the people who are making tools for the Artemis missions can test how well those tools work uh, in lunar soil, essentially. And we can check that against the measurements that we have from the Apollo missions from the surface of the moon. So a brief, uh, go into a little more detail about analog versus simulant. An analog is um, basically used to answer questions about how the stuff that is there presently um, formed and has changed. So for example, how did the clay minerals on Mars form? Whereas a simulant is used to answer questions about how the rocks or soils that are there behave or how they can be used. Like how will our sampling tool work on the moon or could we grow plants in the soil of Mars? So they're, they're overlapping, but they are different. So some of my current work that I'm doing, um, looking into how the clay minerals on Mars formed. Uh, for one of these projects, we take uh, basalt from Iceland, uh, so lava rock from Iceland, um, and expose it to different kinds of water. It could be acidic water, it could be neutral water, like what falls out of the sky. Um, and we see, you know, how much water do we need and what pH or what acidity um, gives us minerals that look like the minerals that form on the surface of Mars. And so far we're seeing that uh, acidic water was probably present on early Mars, but just acidic water doesn't fully explain all of the minerals that are present on the Martian surface. So. We're, we're narrowing down the field. We've picked out something that was probably there, but we don't have the whole story yet. And that's kind of how all science works. We get it one Lego brick at a time. And then I'm also looking at uh, sort of building on those experiments. Well, if you have a bunch of carbon dioxide around, you expect that to form carbonate minerals. Um, but we don't see a lot of carbonate minerals on Mars even though uh, the conditions are presumably pretty favorable because Mars has a very thick CO2 atmosphere or presumably had a very thick CO2 atmosphere. Right now it has a very thin CO2 atmosphere. But we're trying to figure out, you know, if you add carbon dioxide to this equation of water altering basalt, where do you get carbonates and where do you not get carbonates? And these are very early experiments, so we haven't really narrowed down on any answers to that question yet. Then I also work uh, managing the soil chemistry and mineralogy lab, which is this picture right here. Uh, it, is, it is my pride and joy. I've put a lot of work into it. Uh, it didn't used to be that clean, but a lot of what I do is making sure that everyone who uses the lab has space to do their experiments, make sure that all the equipment works, um, and make sure that we have all the instrumentation that we need to uh, get the data that helps us understand the experiments that we're doing. Then on the simulant side, uh, we're trying to simulate with our simulants uh, the, the lunar regolith or the soil on the moon. 
And uh, this is to make sure that the drive tubes that they're going to use to collect samples of lunar soil when they go there on the Artemis missions are able to get through the whole column of soil that they need to pick up. So we need to know sort of what the density of that soil is going to be like so the tube can get through it and how cohesive is it gonna be and all that kind of stuff. So we're figuring out a way to make those profiles as accurate as possible based on the data we have from the Apollo missions. And then I'm also helping out uh, with management of that lab because it is a very large, very frequently used lab that's kind of a lot for just one person to manage. Um, so I'm helping out with things like uh, organization, inventories of all of our different simulants, um, and then just guidance on processes and procedures. So a quick little summary, um, where I started and where I ended up. Basically, I just started with curiosity and passion. I just thought Mars and volcanoes were the coolest things ever, and I wanted to know everything about them. I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I didn't know what it took to be an astronaut but I wanted to know as much as possible. And so I worked really hard to develop the skills that I needed to pursue those interests and those passions as a career. My line towards that career was by no means straight. Um, and not all of the detours that I took were by choice. Uh, I was very privileged to have access to a lot of help along the way um, and privileged to be able to take advantage of that help. But through the adversities that I encountered, I managed to persevere. But I also adjusted my goals to fit my personality rather than the other way around. I don't think, personally, I would really enjoy being an astronaut. I like my free time too much. Uh, I like being self-directed uh, a little too much. And I don't really like working out, which is something that you have to do a lot when you're an astronaut because you have to be in super good shape to go to space. Um, but through all of this, my number one lesson that I have taken away from everything is that the best piece of information you can have in any given situation is knowing who to ask, who to ask about, you know, what grad schools are good, uh, who to ask about where you can get an internship, who to ask about, you know, where are the largest volcanoes in the solar system? Um, and if you don't know who to ask, just ask lots of different people who you should ask, uh, and eventually one of them will know the answer. So with that, uh, I really appreciate y'all tuning in uh, and listening to me and the rest of our, uh, our science team. And with that, I will stop sharing and pass it over to Joanna for her story. My name is Joanna Clark and I'm a Mars geoscientist working for um, a company called the Geocontrol Systems on the Jacobs Jets contract at NASA Johnson Space Center. And today I'll be talking to you about how I became a scientist and then any advice that I have for you about finding your own career path. So as I mentioned, I'm a Mars geoscientist and I've been working on the, the Jacobs JETS contract at NASA Johnson Space Center since 2015. So it's been about seven years. And most of the work that I do involves a Mars Curiosity rover, which is in Gale Crater Mars. And my roles include interpreting science data that come down from Mars and I also do operations for one of the instruments on the rover, which is very exciting. I also manage two labs and I do a lot of laboratory science. A lot of the lab work that I do involves instruments that are similar to one of the instruments on the Curiosity rover, which is called the Sample Analysis at Mars Instrument or SAM. And basically what I do is I run minerals, rocks, astromaterials like meteorites and mixtures of rocks and minerals in order to create a database which we can use to understand the data that we get down from Mars. And ultimately, we're trying to figure out what Mars's climate and environment was like in the past and what this means for potential past habitability and how these surface rocks have changed over time. So this presentation will mainly be about how I went from being a high school student with no clue about what I wanted to do for a career to where I am now. And hopefully this can help some of you figure out a path forward with your careers. And I know some of you may be in high school and I started out just like you, but I was, and maybe there are some people from New York here, but I was in upstate New York in a town called Niskayuna. And when I was in high school, I was really interested in sports, especially track and field. 
And it doesn't seem like this would have a lot to do with science, but it actually taught me a lot of really important lessons that I use at my job and also just in life in general, like not giving up when things are hard, determination and consistency. So this was very important to me. So to me, sports were very important for teaching me how to do hard work. And I'm sure all of you have your own unique passions and hobbies that can also teach you these lessons. And I also thought that I might want to do something in the medical field for a long time, maybe something like a doctor. And so I decided to do an internship when I was a senior in high school at a hospital. And what I found was that I actually didn't really like it that much. And I also am afraid of blood. So that was not going to work out for me in the long term. So, um, however, I really did like earth science class. And the funny thing is that at my high school, you actually did not have to take earth science. A lot of students bypassed earth science and went directly to advanced biology, and they never even took earth science. And I was faced with that choice as well, but I did decide to take earth science class, and I really ended up liking it. So my advice would be to take all the classes that you can, because until you take it, you really just don't know what's going to spark your interest. Even if you think you may not be interested in it, maybe you just take it just to find out. And when I was trying to figure out what to major in when I went to college, I decided that I would do geology because I had enjoyed earth science class so much. And I had no idea what I wanted to do with geology. And I think that's completely normal. And this may, some of you may relate to this, but I also got a lot of feedback from my parents because they didn't know anything about geology because they were in the medical field and they were not sure if I could get a job. They were very doubtful of that. <laughs> so there was a lot of uncertainty on my part, and there was also a lot of uncertainty on the part of my family about earth science and geology and what you could possibly do with it as a career. So maybe some of you can relate to that. So after graduating high school, I went to college at the State University of New York at Geneseo, which is a small town in Western New York called Geneseo. And at Geneseo, I got a bachelor's in geological sciences with a concentration on chemistry, and I also had a, a minor in biology. So there's some of you on the line who I think may be in college, and you may know that classes are not always easy, and this is perfectly normal. So there were several classes that were very challenging for me, and one of the things that helped me were study groups. And study groups were useful because it gave me more motivation to do the homework and study because I was with my friends. And we could also bounce ideas off of each other. And I had to go to tutoring sessions and office hours for many of my um, math and science classes, especially. And it was just because it was challenging for me at first. So my advice would be that if a class is difficult for you, just don't give up on it, especially if it's what you want to do for your career. Just because it's difficult and you get a bad grade on an exam, it doesn't mean that you have to give up. Just make sure that you put in the effort to do things like going to study groups and get tutoring. But it is very normal for these things to be difficult. And another big advice or piece of advice that I would have to give, and um, other people may talk about this, is that you should find internships and in research. And this is really important because doing research and doing internships will help you figure out what is it that you really want to do with your career path. It will tell you what you're interested in and what you're not interested in, and it will help you develop your research skills, which it will be very important when you either apply for a job or for graduate school. Also, when you do an internship or if you do research, you'll probably be working with a professional or a professor. And this is important because they can help you network as far as finding jobs or finding graduate schools. And they can also write you letters of recommendation, which is very, very important. So these letters of recommendation will be essential when you apply for jobs in graduate school. So it's super important to make good connections with your professors and with the professionals that you're doing research with. And it's also important because um, you can list it on your resume when you apply to jobs or to graduate school and the internships can actually lead to jobs. So for me personally, I didn't have an internship that led to my job, but there's a lot of people in my building that I work with that did have that experience. So it's definitely something to look into. Um, I did do research in a geochemistry lab when I was in college and that helped me get accepted to graduate school because it was on my resume. 
And I actually even talked about that research during my interview for my current job because it was relevant. And I think that really helped me get my job. So after I graduated from Geneseo, I applied to some graduate schools and I ended up going to the University of Alabama, which is in Tuscaloosa, the one with the football team. And I got my master's of science in geological sciences. So when I was an undergraduate college at Geneseo, I didn't really know how to apply for graduate school in geology. I didn't have a whole lot of guidance. So this was a very difficult process for me. And I asked my professors if I could even get into grad school and how I should go about applying for it. And some of them gave me some kind of vague advice about what schools to apply to and just to email those professors. So I had to do a lot of this work on my own. So I ended up Googling different universities and professors that study the same topics that I was interested in, which at the time was actually paleontology, which is the study of fossils. So then I sent emails to those professors and I asked them if they were looking for students and if they had funding for the next year. A lot of them didn't respond. Um, one of them had actually passed away and some of them did not have funding, but um, I did find one that uh, was accepting students. But one thing that a lot of people don't know about, you know, getting a graduate degree in the natural sciences is that it's typically completely paid for. So I was accepted to the University of Alabama with a full scholarship and a stipend. And that just means that they paid for my tuition and they pay you a small amount of money so that you can pay your rent and also things like food and gas and uh, car insurance, things like that. And in exchange for that, I did have to teach geology labs, including Geology 101 and also paleontology. And my thesis, which is basically um, the research topic that you study and which you write um, some papers on, that was actually about paleoclimatology and uh, geochemistry of fossil brachiopods, which is pictured here. And it was nothing to do with planetary science. And at the time, there weren't even any professors in my department who studied planetary science. And I truly thought that I was going to do something with paleoclimatology or paleontology. However, when I was doing my thesis, I did develop a lot of skills in geochemistry, which were applicable to other topics and not just fossils, although fossils are very cool. So after I graduated with my master, oh, sorry, with my master's in geology from the University of Alabama, I moved to Houston for personal reasons, but I did not have a job. So since I didn't have a job, I started to look for jobs and I applied to a bunch of jobs, many of which I was not qualified for at all. I had a master's in geology and I had published two research papers relating to paleoclimatology at the time. And finally, I found a job requisition that I was qualified for, which is a job that I have now. And I then went to the interview and I realized that it was actually at the NASA campus. And this was, this is kind of funny, but it was actually a big surprise to me and it was a good surprise. <laughs> and I ended up getting this job because my background in geochemistry was applicable to what I was going to be doing in the science department here. And although I had used geochemistry to study fossils, it was also applicable to the job that I have now. However, this was my first experience with planetary science, so I had to do a lot of learning on the job. And then about two years after I started working at this job, I decided to pursue my PhD, which is um, funded by my company, Geocontrols. And having a PhD is not required to do research in planetary science, but I decided to pursue this degree because I just thought it could open some more doors as far as opportunities for um, applying for grants and also being involved with missions. But it is not required to research. It was just something that I chose to do. Um, getting my PhD was a lot of hard work and it took, I, I don't remember exactly how long I've been doing it at this point, but I think I'm on my fourth year. Um, but it was a lot of hard work because I had to take classes and do homework when I was done with work for the day. So I had to spend a lot of time doing work for my PhD after work instead of having fun or relaxing at night. But finally, I finished my classes about a year ago and my dissertation is almost done and I am signed up to graduate in May. So I will have my PhD and then I'll be done with school hopefully forever. So I just wanna conclude with a little bit about what I actually do for my job as a geoscientist at, at NASA on the JETS contract. 
So most of what I do is analyzing data from the Curiosity rover, which I mentioned is in Gale Crater Mars. And as I mentioned, I work for an instrument called the Sample Analysis at Mars Instrument, or SAM, which is basically just an oven that heats a solid sample. And then we analyze the gases that come off of the sample with something called a mass spectrometer, which you may be familiar with. And the goal of this instrument is to figure out which minerals and phases are present in a solid sample on the surface of Mars, which ultimately helps us better understand Mars's geologic history and if it was ever habitable. And I also manage two labs. One of them is a general chemistry lab and the other one is called the mega lab. And this contains instruments that are similar to the SAM instrument on the Curiosity rover. So it's kind of a flight analog instrument. And I run lab experiments on this flight analog instrument to help us understand the data from the SAM instrument on the rover. So the data actually coming down from Mars. And um, I also do operations. I'm a payload uplink lead for the SAM instrument, which basically just means that when I do operations, I tell the SAM instrument what experiments or activities to do for the day. And to me, that's the most exciting part of my job just because I mean, it's really cool just to be able to be involved with operating a rover on another planet. So that's the coolest part of my job for me. And I did not learn how to do that when I was in college. This is something that I had to learn on the job. And what they did is they sent me to Goddard Space Flight Center and I trained with um, another operations person. And then I had to spend a lot of time shadowing. And as part of my job, I also write a lot of papers. That's a big part of my job since I'm in research. And I also give a lot of presentations. And then finally, I like to do outreach because it helps me give back to the community and it helps get others interested in STEM. So that's a big passion of mine. So now I'll hand it off to Jordan Marie. And if anyone has questions about my career path or what I actually do for my job, you can just save that for the end. So thank you, and I will stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Joanna. Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending the webinar today. Uh, my name is Jordan Marie Dudley, and I'm a project manager and planetary geochemist for a contracting company called Jacobs, located at NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. And like Joanna and SJ, uh, I'm here today to talk to you about what exactly that looks like, and more so to tell you about how I got here. So what I think is uh, really great about this event is that it shows that no two paths to one place are the same. Uh, so the first question I usually get from people when I tell them what I do is, um, one, are aliens real? After we clear that up, the second question I usually get is along the lines of, were you always interested in space as a kid? And it's typically assumed that I must have dreamed about working for NASA or being an astronaut or a scientist or all of the above. Uh, but the truth is, I wasn't interested in space science at all as a kid, um, nor was I in high school or even during my bachelor's degree in college. My path into planetary science was very non-traditional. Uh, it was challenging, um, but it was also flexible in the sense that I gave myself room to try a lot of different things along the way so that a large amount of it was unplanned. So I knew the general direction of what I wanted to do and I knew what I liked to do, but in terms of where I would go and what I would do with that, um, that was a little bit all over the place. But not having that strict plan and being open to trying new opportunities is what actually individualized my path and prepared me for this position. And so I'm originally from the East Coast and clearly it didn't take one day and 36 minutes to get to Houston. Um, instead, I did some traveling to seek different experiences across the globe on my way. And in the next few slides, I'm gonna walk through uh, those different experiences that I have marked on this map to tie everything together into one story. So I grew up in Meriden, Connecticut. It's a small, close-knit community. Uh, my parents grew up there as well. And they actually went to the same K through 12 schools as me. Uh, we even had some of the same teachers. 
coincidentally, my dad and I actually had the same kindergarten teacher and I just gave a presentation yesterday to her daughter's uh, middle school class because she is now also a teacher in that area as well. <laughs> Um, I have three younger sisters. I am the first person in my family to graduate from college, uh, which also makes me the first to receive a graduate degree. And the majority of uh, my classmates growing up actually did not pursue post GED learning. Being that I was uh, the first in my family to pursue a college degree, Combined with the fact that our district uh, didn't have a ton of resources and my family couldn't afford to pay for me to go to college, um, I ended up having to work pretty hard in K through 12 so that I could get scholarships to go to school. So eventually I ended up getting a full scholarship my senior year um, and moved to Boston in 2011 to go to Boston University. Uh, while I was there, I actually studied both chemistry and visual art. And at the time I intended to be a pre-medical student, uh, but clearly that didn't happen since I am not a doctor. But since I was both a scientist and an artist, uh, I also worked decorating luxury wedding cakes as a sugar artist back home in Connecticut and New York during the summers. Uh, and I actually did that for six years in and out of school. I graduated from BU in 2015. And at this point, the pre-med track didn't work out for me. Um, and I was really unsure about what to do next. I knew that I enjoyed science and I had my bachelor's degree at this point, but I didn't know what I wanted to use it for. Uh, and that was mostly because I didn't know any professionals in STEM and I was unaware of what my options were. So I decided to take a year off to explore what I liked. Um, at the time, this was chemistry and earth science because I had dabbled in it a bit in school. So um, even though it technically was a year off, I did sign up for additional classes at the local state school after I moved back home. Um, and then I kept working as a sugar artist, decorating wedding cakes, and I got a second job as a barista at a local coffee shop so that I could pay for those classes. I also job shadowed at an environmental consulting firm. Um, and this opportunity allowed me to connect with a really great mentor who was able to point me in different directions for a career in earth science. And then the most pivotal experience I had was actually a volunteer position. So after graduating school, I knew that if I wanted to do research eventually, I would need to get some research experience somewhere. So I actually reached out to different professors at schools in Connecticut and volunteered my time to work for them. I had explained the situation told them that I was a chemistry graduate um, and that I was willing to work for free in their labs to gain some research experience. So it turns out there's only one professor that got back to me <laughs> and I ended up working for him as a lab tech for one year in his lab, which was a solar system geochemistry lab. Um, so this was my lucky hook into planetary science. Um, it was how I learned that I could apply bench top chemistry to questions about the solar system. Um, and I really enjoyed it, enjoyed it. I was just like completely amazed by it. So it was at this point that I then decided to apply to Wesleyan University, which is where this volunteer experience was um, to be a full-time master's student. But before that, uh, I actually made one more stop in Safford, Arizona. So in Safford, I completed an analytical chemistry internship for a company called Freeport McMoran um, that runs a copper and gold mine out of a very small city called Marenzi, Arizona. And then nearby Marenzi in Safford, Arizona, which is where I was, um, they do the bulk of their rock crushing, dissolution, and testing of samples that are collected at the mine. So I worked there at the laboratory as a chemist on acid leach solution testing to monitor worker exposure to dangerous gases. Um, and I also did some method development with some of their instruments there. When that was over, I went back to Connecticut and I completed my master's at Wesleyan University from 2016 to 2018. And my degree was in earth and environmental sciences with a planetary science concentration. And my thesis entitled here 
uh, studied water and meteorites to learn about the water available in the solar system at the time that Earth formed so that we could learn more about how Earth became habitable um, and about what the origins of water were. And to do this, um, Wesleyan actually sent me to Sapporo, Japan in 2017 to collect our analyses for the project. And then in 2018, I presented those results at an annual conference that's called the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference. And it's held in the Woodlands, Texas, not too far from Houston. And so um, this conference is actually occurring next week. And so I'll be there again to uh, meet other scientists and present research. But uh, in 2018, that was my first time attending. And this was where I was able to meet NASA and Jacob scientists. Um, I presented my work to them and I actually did a couple of in-person interviews with some of the scientists so that when I got back to Connecticut, I ended up getting a job offer um, and moved to Houston a few months later. So now from July 2018 to the present, um, I actually wear two hats. So I work as a planetary geochemist and I continue to study hydrogen to learn about water in the solar system with different types of meteorite samples. I also assist experiments for other projects that um, use my chemistry background and involve uh, wet chemistry experiments. Um, I do some work with some of the Apollo samples that were collected from the moon. I do some work in sample preparation and coming up with new ways to prepare our precious samples. And I also do a little bit of work in um, software solutions for some of our projects. And then for my second role uh, as a project manager, I manage the projects and scientific budget for a team of really awesome research scientists at JSC, uh, including SJ and Joanna. We all work on the same team together. And my job is to make sure that basically that we're fulfilling the work on our contract with NASA. Um, I also track and approve purchases, I uh, estimate our monthly spending, and I report statuses of work in our facilities to NASA management. Lastly, uh, one of my favorite parts of my job that I wanted to mention is that I get to meet and interact with different people. Uh, I get to be an advocate for an inclusive and equitable scientific community and I get to share resources in STEM. So outside of the day tasks of my job, I'm also involved in a significant amount of external activities. This includes SWAN, uh, Supporting Women at NASA, which is a group that Joanna and I actually co-president to coordinate outreach events in the local community um, and provide professional development opportunities to our members. Last fall in the uh, first picture on the left here, I sat on a panel for an event for the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and this was a really, really cool event that I was excited to participate in uh, because it was hosted for students at historically black colleges and universities um, and also Hispanic serving institutions and tribal uh, serving institutions. So that was uh, a really, really cool event. I've also been involved in the CIS program, the STEM Enhancement in Earth Sciences Summer Internship Program, which some of you on this call have either participated in or are hoping to participate in, uh, where I worked as a mentor for a group of high school summer interns for two years. I'm also involved in a group that's not shown on this slide, I forgot to put this in here, but they are called the Women of Color Project, and it's based out of Harvard. And we organize annual workshops for women of color that are applying to graduate school to help them with the process. And then lastly, I do outreach events through my own initiative, like the event I did at the school back home, which is pictured in the screenshot in the lower left corner. So that's me and all of the things that I'm involved in and a short summary of my very long unplanned path to get there. So if you have similar interests, I hope that this was useful for you. Um, and with that, why don't we pass it over to Paige so that SJ, Joanna, and I can take some questions. I really want to thank the three of you for sharing your career paths, the challenges you had to face as you were going through your careers, the, the twists and turns, the unknowing, and you know all of that, because I think what you described really does 
um, sort of strike a chord perhaps with many of those that are on the line today. My first question that I see in this list here, um, and perhaps each of you can speak to this, um, the, the students would like to know, what does NASA look for in an application? What makes an application stand out? And I'm gonna assume like for a job. It could also be for a C's, C's internship application, but in terms of a job, what, does, what do you think NASA looks for in an application? And maybe we'll start with SJ and then go to Joanna and then Jordan Marie. Yeah, uh, I, I can't speak too much from, from personal experience, nor can I speak for NASA. Um, but I think one of the things that, that helps a lot um, is a, a good um, connection between what you have done prior to your application and what you are applying for. You don't necessarily have to have experience in the exact field that you're going into, but you have to be able to articulate how you can apply the experience that you do have. Um, so really being able to sit down and think about how can my skills be useful to this position that I'm applying for uh, will really strengthen your application. Anything to add, Joanna? Yeah, I was just writing down some notes for what I was thinking about this. So um, I know when I applied for jobs, um, I had, I think it was at University of Alabama, I took um, advantage of a, like a, um, a program where they helped you apply for jobs. And one of the things that they said was that when you see a job requisition that you are qualified for and you, um, you know, submit that application to make sure that you really emphasize that you have all those qualifications. Um, so that's one thing. Um, so you do, if you do have a career center at your college, I would definitely take advantage of that and they'll help you prepare your resume and um, uh, I forgot what it's called, cover letters, things like that, and help you prepare for interviews. Um, I think it's also good to appear really organized and put together. And maybe that seems obvious, but when, when I went to my interview, for example, I printed out my resume and I put it in a binder. And then I also printed out my research papers so that I could just hand it to them and show them um, like, here's all my stuff. And they didn't have to look it up or anything. It was all in front of them. So I think that showed them that I was organized and put together. Um, and then as SJ was saying, research and internships and how they actually apply to the job that you are applying for, that's really important. And also to be a good communicator. So when you work at NASA, you're going to have to work with a team. So it's really important that you're able to communicate your science and communicate what you have done in the past and how, how, why it's important. So that's what I would say. Any additional thoughts, Jordan Marie? Yes, so one that I had was similar to Joanna, so communication. Um, so as scientists and specifically as contractors, um, we interact a lot with each other um, and a lot with the other um, government employees at NASA. And so the success of our science depends on our ability to communicate with each other. And in addition to that, we are also responsible for communing, communicating information to the public. And so the public is actually the primary beneficiary of the work that we do. So it's really great if you can showcase your communication skills, either in your resume or in an in-person or virtual maybe interview these days um, to show that you can contribute in that way. The other thing that I wanted to add to that is adaptability. And so when I got this position, um, the main reason I was told that I, I was accepted was because I actually had that chemistry background and I didn't just have like a strict geology background because it kind of set me apart from the other applicants where I had a different skill set than the other people coming in and I could use that skill set and apply it to multiple projects because there are so many different kinds of projects in our department um, that require different types of work. And so, um, they want to know, can you apply your skills to multiple projects? 
And if you don't have those skills, are you up for the challenge of learning those new skills so that you can contribute to those projects? Um, so the main two things that I would say are communication and adaptability. And thank you all three of you for, for those contributions, because I think those are outstanding sort of things to, for folks to keep in mind. And that adaptability and that ability to show that you are hardworking. I think I remember SJ saying a number of times how, you know, hardworking and, you know, and all three of them talking about navigating a different course and not quite knowing where exactly they wanted to go, but showing the perseverance that you can do anything. If you can sell yourself in how you um, sort of showcase yourself in a resume, as well as the communication of how you can be successful and attack any problem with a, a, um, an innovative way of thinking. All of those things I think each of our presenters talked about during their um, career pathways talk. And I think those are really important things. Um, it, it, this came to a question that came in earlier. Is it only the college that you went to? Does the college, and perhaps I'll throw this question out for any of our, our scientists to answer. When NASA or Jacobs or any kind of contract or any person looking for a job in the NASA science realm, does the college an individual goes to Go, does the college that an individual went to or ends up going to, is that the sole thing that influences a decision on getting a job? Can anyone, would anyone like to speak to that? Go ahead, Joanna. I just have an opinion on this because uh, where I grew up, a lot of people were um, kind of like upper class and a lot of them went to really expensive schools. And I was in like a middle-class family and when I, we could only afford to go to um, a state school. So I went to SUNY Geneseo, which is a very good school, but I think it's really what you make of it when you go to that school. So, you know, if you go to a school that's, you know, very well known and expensive and you don't really, um, I don't know, put any effort into it, it's not going to really mean anything. But if you go to any other school, it just, it just what you make of it. If you study, if you join the clubs, if you are passionate about it, I don't think it matters what school you go to because you're going to have that knowledge and that passion. Anyone else? I can also add to that. Um, and second, what exactly what Joanna said that it's the work that you do with what you have available to you that matters more. And um, I actually had somebody at a, a college admissions office say this to me at Harvard as well, which I thought was interesting because Harvard is one of those schools that we think that it's so prestigious and it is, but at the same time, Harvard is accepting students that um, do a lot with whatever is available to them. And I think the same thing applies to the workforce and to NASA where we're looking to see, everybody is looking to see um, how much you do with the resources that you have avail available to you and how hard you work with them. Um, and also, um, one thing I'll add is that when you apply to graduate school, it's a bit different than when you apply to undergraduate school in the sense that it matters more who your advisor is, what work they're doing, um, and how that work is regarded in the scientific community, um, which is a very different take than when you apply to an undergraduate university and you're looking at things like um, how prestigious is this school? Um, where does this XYZ program rank among other schools? For graduate schools, um, it's more about the research and who's doing what research and whether or not you can get involved in that work. Any Anything else on that one? I think okay. they covered it. Great, and you know, the word polls, uh, the word clouds, I thought, and Slido's new, so for at least for me. So I thought we were going, it was going to actually create a word cloud for us, but instead it actually gave us just a list of keywords that were most important for folks. So um, 
I don't have a word cloud to show and we are at the top of the hour. So I'm just going to briefly because so many of you actually shared key words that were important for each presenter. So I at least want to take a moment at this top of the hour before we continue with questions to mention some of the important words, at least the top five for each person. And for SJ, the top five words that from folks from your presentation were perseverance, curiosity, passion, hard work, and Mars. So, and your sixth one was inspiring. So I, I have to include that one as well, because I thought that was a good one. So um, I'm going to see if at some point I can make that a word cloud, but I thought I'd share that for SJ. For Joanna, the top five um, words that came in for you for this word cloud that I hope hopefully can create, determination, perseverance again, research, curiosity again, internships, and also hard work. So I guess I'll go with six. And then for um, Jordan Marie, and I think this is interesting too from, from, their, from our scientists' perspective, some of these words. So for Jordan Marie, research, internships, flexible, hardworking, open-minded, and your sixth one was opportunity. Um, so though I think those keywords are kind of interesting and you know, perseverance and hard work, um, I think are really key things for um, success in any career. Now this, this particular question, I it might actually, we might start with Joanna because someone has asked, is it better to go to grad school before or after applying for a job associated with NASA? So you're in the midst of a degree. So do you have any thoughts on, on that particular question? I think it really depends on your personal situation. So um, like for me, when I started, I didn't have a whole lot. I mean, I'm not saying that I didn't have a life, but I had time after work where I could devote to um, going to classes and um, studying and doing all that stuff. But, um, you know, it's, for some people, it may be easier to finish the PhD or your graduate degree first and then focus on your job. Because I, I'm not going to lie, like when getting a PhD while working, it is a lot of hard work because um, the way that I did it was um, I use the research that I do at my job and um, I'm using that for my dissertation. So that's the bulk of it. But for the classes and actually compiling the dissertation and the presentation for my dissertation, that's all done outside of work hours. And that's a lot of work. So there were a lot of nights when I was up until past midnight and, you know, I had friends that were going to do fun things. And um, recently I've had to turn down a lot of things because um, my dissertation defense is coming up. And so I've had to say no to a lot of things. And so it's just, I think it's, it depends on your personal situation, whether you have time for that, um, because it really is. For, for a lot of it, when, when you're taking classes, it's going to be getting up, doing work, and then after work, you're doing more work. And so and all that- I'm not, trying, I'm, not trying to I'm very happy that I did it and I'm really excited to graduate. Um, but yeah, I think it just depended on your situation. And the nice thing too that Joanna mentioned is that she's working and Joanna, is, was it correct that you said that your company is paying for you to continue your education? They are, yes. And so those types of things, depending on the type of employment you get or a job that you get, there are sometimes the opportunities for a company who wants you to progress and build more skills. And so getting a degree while you're working, it is hard, but sometimes it takes that burden of what it would cost off of you. Now, I want to actually toss this slightly over to SJ because SJ, you talked about, you know, not, you know, getting turned down time and time again. And did that ever frustrate you to the point where you were like, well, maybe I just don't want to get this type of degree or try something else. Can you talk a little bit to that? 
Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, the answer to your question is yes. Uh, there, there were definitely times when I, I felt like, you know, maybe I'm just not, I'm not cut out for this. Um, it's not something that, that I can do. You know, maybe I was good enough for undergraduate, but I'm not good enough for graduate school. Um, and uh, this was during a time when I was deeply depressed. Um, but, you know, there, there was also a sense of, you know, if, if I don't keep trying, what, what have the last like 22 years of my life been then? Um, because I really like, I had wanted it for so long and it meant so much to me that I was like, if I don't try and do this like one more time, just one more time, um, am I gonna be this miserable for the rest of my life, right? Um, so, so there were definitely times that I, I felt like giving up and, and that I thought, well, maybe I can do something else. Um, but I didn't really want to do something else. Um, so I think, you know, if, if UNLV grad school hadn't worked out, I, I would have found some other way to, to make it happen. Um, just because it's, it's, it's what I have to do. Like, it's my thing. Um, and, and yeah, I, I think it, it can be very challenging and, Definitely, like if it's making you more miserable to try, then it would make you happy to succeed. Um, then it's time to try something else. Um, I hope that sentence made some kind of sense. But yeah, that's kind of that's that's my take on uh, when to persevere and when to back off. And that's great. You know, where there's a will, there's a way, and that perseverance um, is is so important. It comes down to if you really want it find a way to make it work and you never know what avenue um, to that you'll find it. And I think it was SJ that also said, you know, know who to ask. And if that person doesn't know, ask someone else. And if that person doesn't know, ask someone else. And if you keep on following your dreams, you never know what new doors might open up and what new path, as even Jordan Marie kind of talked about, where you'll find emerging of, wow, I never knew these two things kind of could work together. And now I'm getting to, to do something that I wouldn't have ever imagined. Um, so great input. You know, here's a question. Oh, and I just lost it because I, I, one of you made me think of this. We had a question that came in that said, is it okay to struggle in a subject that's closely related to a career you want to pursue. Um, so does anyone have any thoughts on that question? Is it okay to struggle in a subject that is closely related to the career you want to pursue? Anyone? I think absolutely. Oh, I'll let Jordan Marie talk. I was just going to say absolutely as well. Um, I know Joanna mentioned it in her presentation, this exact topic. Um, I didn't talk about it too much, but I did mention that my intention was to be a pre-med student when I went to college and I actually went in as a chemistry major. And once I started, I realized that um, I was struggling so much in my classes that I probably wasn't going to have a high enough GPA to get into medical school. And so that is why I ended up not continuing my pre-med track. However, ironically, I'm still a chemist today, um, but it, the reason I struggled wasn't necessarily because I wasn't good at it. It was because I really had to adjust my study habits and um, kind of take the time to learn my own learning style, which I never had to do in high school. Things just kind of came easy to me then. And so when I was in college, um, I was, you know, working at a different level um, and I was in a different caliber of classes. And so I just had to take the time to take a minute and figure out what worked for me and what didn't and just adjust it accordingly. And so I ended up figuring it out later into my academic career, but I definitely struggled in the first part of it. Um, but now when I, so when I applied for my master's and now even when I'm, I apply to different jobs, if they do ask for my transcript, um, they will see that I did struggle in the beginning, but it actually makes a really good talking point. And I think a lot of the times people are very impressed by the fact that I went through that struggle and then I figured out a way to um, get better later on. 
And so um, it's completely normal to have that experience. Um, I think the most important part is what do you do in that struggle? Um, and are you able to um, figure out what you need to change so that um, you can get better at whatever it is that you're having a hard time with? Did you want to add anything, Joanna? Um, I think a lot of what Jordan Marie said was really good. Um, I know for me, <clears throat> I mean, it started as early as I think probably middle school or high school. I remember taking math classes and I think maybe I started in the advanced math class, but they told me that I wasn't doing well enough. So they switched me back to like the down, like the, I don't know, like whatever you want to call it, the regular one. And so I remember hearing like there was one day and I remember the teacher was talking to this other girl in the class and saying how she was so good at math and how she should become a scientist or something like that and no one was ever telling me that and so I felt like you know I'm struggling at this and you know I'm not doing very well maybe I can't do this for a career but I like Jordan Marie said you know just keep going and if that's what you want there's no reason it can't happen. You just have to do things like study sessions and tutoring and just work really hard. And I don't think there's anything that will stop you because we, we all have struggles with classes. They are very hard. <laughs> and grades aren't everything, even though a grade tells you, you know, what, what you have achieved in a class the um, the grade in itself on a transcript, yes, it looks good, but when you're looking for a job, how you approach answering the questions in an interview, how you say, you know, yes, I might have been a C student in this subject area, but here's how I made it work for me. And going through and being able to sort of show how you navigated success because success isn't always a letter grade. Success is how you navigated that pathway to achieve what it was that you wanted to achieve, whether it's in a class, whether it's as part of a job, whether it's in a degree that you wanted to pursue. Um, um, keep that in mind, your mindset and your approach to how you can contribute to whatever it is you might be applying to um, is really, really important. Now, I know that we are about 16 minutes past the top of the hour, and I wanna at least first say that I saw a couple of other questions we might not have gotten to related to what kind of degree is better, what college might be a better one to go to. And, and I would say in general, doesn't matter if you have a science or an engineering degree, if you work your way through and you find a door that opens up that might be in a completely different field than you ever thought you were getting a degree in, um, keep your eyes open. Try to get as many different types of experiences so you can find what works for you. If you want to be a doctor and then you might find out, oh, I don't like that. So change your path and then re-pursue whether it's in a degree or coursework that you can continue to take. And Joanna, by the way, we have a SUNY Geneseo person that was on the line as well. So um, go SUNY Geneseo. <laughs> um, so first of all, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a slide back up on the screen because um, at least I'm gonna try to. Um, as we are at the middle of this or the 718 central time, um, our time is more or less up. And I really hope that those of you that joined us today, that you really found a story that perhaps resonates with you or that you can think about as you pursue your future career path to NASA science or to any other field, engineering, science, whatever the case may be. Keep your eyes open and think about the perseverance, the hard work, and how these three individuals today shared their story and how it worked for them. 
Um, I also certainly want to take a moment to thank SJ, Joanna, and Jordan Marie. They work very hard day in and day out, and yet they are still so excited to be able to share with all of you their career paths and their passions because they want to see you have success in your futures as well. I also want to take a moment to thank again the C's summer high school intern program that some of you may be applying for or may have participated in. Um, Jordan Marie and SJ have been mentors in that program and we are so thankful to C's and Margaret Baggio and Selena Miller for hosting this webinar event today. Um, we couldn't have done it without them and we're so happy that we were able to share um, our subject matter experts with all of you as you continue to think about your future career paths. Thanks everyone.